20th century looked at the importance of transportation, we looked at the importance of labor, we looked at immigration. Uh, we tried to understand the role of cities, and since uh, those first uh, kind of introductory classes, we've been looking at a whole set of challenges that uh, modern cities face, and uh, with uh, special understandings of right here in Boston. So by having looked at the whole question as we did last week of the role of the big city newspaper, having looked at uh, uh, <coughs> urban safety with uh, Commissioner Davis, having looked at the question of uh, uh, education and uh, uh, issues like that, we want to wrap this up by saying to make progress in all of this, we need to have leadership. Leadership in the public sector, leadership in the business sector, leadership in the nonprofit sector. Now, quite honestly, we had three different speakers tonight, all lined up for us. We had the mayor, who unfortunately, as all of you know, has had a serious accident and is getting out of his home much less than he would like, driving both himself and his wife nuts. Um, we had Paul uh, Guzzi, the president of the Greater Boston uh, Chamber of Commerce, all lined up until this morning when he reported that he has 102 fever in his home and we wish him well. And we had uh, the president of Northeastern University uh, was going to join us tonight as well. Uh, but he is tied up with a special board of trustees meeting. We have two of our three speakers. Our third speaker uh, will be joining us um, to discuss these issues. Judith Curlin, who was chief of staff to the mayor until three days ago and has now taken on a much more wonderful position. And we are looking forward to working with her with that. I'll introduce her in more detail in a minute. We have Paul Grogan, who, as you know, has been co-teaching this course. But tonight is here not as the co-teacher, but as the president of the Boston Foundation. And we hope to have joining us Richard Freeland, the former president of this great institution for 10 years. This building, in fact, was built uh, when uh, Richard was president and is now Massachusetts Commissioner of Higher Education. So we want to look at the role of public leaders. We want to look at the role of business leaders, the role of anchor institutions. Um, I am reminded that when I first moved to Boston in 1971 from Detroit, uh, there was an organization, kind of a shady organization, but people knew who they were, called The Vault. If I remember correctly, they met actually in the vault of the Boston Safe Deposit Bank. And these were the top leaders of the city's uh, business elite. They were major bankers, major corporate uh, presidents, uh, insurance uh, CEOs. And they would meet and they'd talk about the major challenges facing Boston in those days, of which, as you remember from one of our first lectures, were legion. Uh, Boston at that time in the early 1970s, according to an analysis done by Brookings Institution, was considered among uh, the cities uh, that were uh, most in trouble financially, most in trouble in terms of unemployment. Uh, we were running large deficits. We're losing population at a rapid rate. Um, we had increasing crime, dilapidated housing. Uh, we were a basket case compared to thriving cities like Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> and the vault was here to try and help us get out of that, working with the mayor. Uh, and they were really the civic leaders. They were the anchor. Of, they, they gave us an anchor institution. But over time, of course, those anchor institutions disappeared as anchor institutions. One of those that was very important was the Bank of Boston, which was transformed into the Fleet Bank, which was transformed into Bay Banks, and then was bought by Bank of America, a corporation which is headquartered in North Carolina. Uh, the CEO of John Hancock was deeply involved in this. Hancock, of course, and its beautiful tower, uh, is actually now owned by Manuel Reif, a major insurance company in Toronto. Uh, the president of Gillette, one of the oldest and largest manufacturing companies in Massachusetts, was an important member of this tribe. Of course, Gillette now is owned by Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati, Ohio. So many of those major institutions that played such an important role because they were here, they were anchored uh, right here in uh, Boston, are no longer the same kind of anchors. The question is, who takes their place? What are the new anchor institutions? 
Well, first of all, we have to realize that the ball provided us with both some very good advice, but it was also in some sense biased advice. It was the advice of a business community. I doubt if there was one single person who represented Dorchester, or represented Roxbury, uh, or represented uh, the homeless, or represented people uh, who were in public housing on the vault. This was not what the vault was all about. Nonetheless, they came up with some very good ideas, and I think we might even credit them with uh, helping in the renaissance of the city. The question is, though, today, with those anchor institutions, not only in this city, but in most cities, gone, what are the new anchor institutions? Who are the new leaders? Uh, and as we become a more diverse population, uh, with uh, the majority of our population now uh, other than uh, non-Hispanic white, who will be the new leaders in terms of the new racial and ethnic groups that have grown up in our city? And that's what we want to talk about tonight. I hope what you'll hear, uh, when Richard gets here, you'll hear from Judith and hear from Paul and maybe a few more times from me, that I believe there are new institutions that can play those roles. Uh, we've seen some of those institutions, and Paul, as many of you know, Paul Grogan has written uh, marvelously about it, the role of community development corporations, the role of other civic institutions in helping rebuild cities, sometimes block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. But we have larger institutions. You're in one of them right now, Northeastern University. Northeastern University has been here for almost 110 years. It is unlikely that it is going to move. We have no plans that, that I know of uh, uh, to move to South Carolina, and I don't think any of us are planning to move to China. We're also probably unlikely a target for an unfriendly merger or takeover. Um, we just don't make enough money. Uh, we wish we made more money, or at least uh, uh, didn't have some of the uh, uh, kind of economic problems we face, but we're not a big profit-making institution that uh, is a prime target uh, for a takeover artist. And that means we're going to stay here, and we're going to stay here for the duration. We also have, um, we're a large institution. We, we employ a lot of people. We have lots and lots of people who live here and work here. Of course, there are many other universities here as well who are not going away. One suspects that Harvard University will probably be here for at least another 400 years uh, if, in fact, their endowment doesn't evolve further. <laughs> we also have large medical institutions that are not going to go away. I doubt whether MGH is going to pick up and move. They may build satellite campuses in other parts of the region, might even someday build satellite campuses in other parts of the world, but I would suspect that MGH is going to stay here along with Beth Israel and the Brigham and other major institutions. One might say the same thing about our major cultural institutions. We watch the uh, MFA, Museum of Fine Arts, uh, adding almost, I believe, a billion dollars worth of new building. Uh, I presume they wouldn't do that if they had plans to pick up their collection and move out of state. We have the BSO. Uh, we also have, um, you know, some other large institutions uh, that are in the private sector that probably won't go away. Uh, we have some businesses that we expect will be here for a long time, and they can play that role as well. But what I hope we'll be doing this evening is exploring what the rights, what the responsibilities are of these organizations to really become true anchor institutions. Take the university. I'll be giving a major paper on this at the Urban Affairs Association in the city of Honolulu, Hawaii in March. <laughs> um, a little warmer there today than it is here. Uh, about the role of anchor institutions, and particularly the university. If you go back and you look at the universities of the 14th century, the 13th and 14th century, most of the universities were not built in major cities. The people who built universities didn't want to be close to where religious leaders were or where political leaders were. You wanted to stay as far away from the king and the pope as you could. <laughs> and therefore you built campuses in Oxford and Cambridge, not London. You built campuses in Bologna and Florence, not Rome. You built campuses in Salamanca, not Madrid. And the result was is they really wanted to become ivory towers, and they did. Ivory towers far away from the hustle and bustle of regular life. And this did give them some great advantages. Uh, it uh, 
help them stay away from persecution. Not always. We're reminded of Galileo. Uh, but it did help them to be able to have an independent uh, look at the world. Today, we still have a lot of ivory towerishness in our universities, including Northeastern. We have lots of faculty who spend a lot of their time, I've done it in my history, looking at things that probably have less to do with the real world than um, the kind of theoretical world that we inhabit. But my argument would be that in the modern society, universities, at least large chunks of universities, and particularly those like Northeastern that are located right here in the city, have a responsibility to work on the great challenges of the city the great challenges of the Commonwealth, the great challenges of the nation, and internationally, both because solving those challenges will make the environment within which we work a better place to be for ourselves, for our students, for the faculty, for the future, and also because we can learn a lot from working with the city and working with the Commonwealth about the kind of key issues that we want to study. And by being able to work closer with the city and work closer with the Commonwealth, we can learn from each other. And in the course of solving or helping to solve some of the challenges we face, also provide a better learning environment for our undergraduate students and our graduate students, and a better research environment for our own faculty. So there's a real symbiotic relationship that can be built here uh, if we pay attention to trying to be a true anchor institution. Similarly, the foundations are going to play an important role. I hope Paul will tell us a lot about kind of the transformation of the Boston Foundation, which I have had the great luxury of watching over the years I've been here, uh, transformed from an institution uh, which did yeoman's work in the city, but was basically reactive, basically responded to uh, organizations that came to them asking for funds to carry out what might, might have been very good work and the foundation would decide to fund A and B and not C. The Boston Foundation, perhaps a leader in this country, has become a proactive foundation. It helps set the agenda on key issues like education, um, looking at the whole question of, of uh, property taxes and the ability of cities and towns uh, to uh, own their own destiny by having a, a greater ability uh, to raise the revenues they need uh, by looking at the whole question of violence in the streets and looking at the question of workforce development and, uh, and so forth. Uh, so these institutions are transforming, I hope, into institutions that can be a real partner with the city, a real partner with the Commonwealth in ways that perhaps uh, we've not seen in the past or at least uh, doing it in a much more intense way. Well, joining us to discuss these issues, as I said, are three wonderful people. We're going to start with Judith Curlman, an old friend of mine from many years back, um, who, as I said, until just a few days ago, was the chief of staff to the mayor, and now is in charge of uh, assuming new, uh, a new position working on programs and partnerships. Uh, Judith was regional director for the United States Department of Health and Human Services during the second Clinton administration. And she was appointed by Secretary of Health and Human Services Donna Shalala in 1997. She received her BA in Political Science from Mount Holyoke College in uh, 1967. She served as the first female commissioner of the Boston Department of Health and Hospitals, I think when I first met her. Uh, from 1988 to 1993, she served on the faculty of the Harvard School of Public Health uh, and Simmons College and the medical schools of both Boston University and Tufts University. She was Vice President of Strategic Planning at the New England Medical Center, began her career all the way back when she worked for one of the most beloved congressmen of all time, uh, Congressman Th Thomas P. Tip O'Neill. And she also worked for former Congressman Michael J. Harrington in 1973. Um, second of all, and he's just joined us, is my very dear friend Richard Freeland, uh, who served as president of this great university during its incredible transformation between 1996 and 2006. And he currently serves uh, in the Commonwealth as the Commissioner of Higher Education for Massachusetts. Uh, as I said earlier, 
uh, one of the buildings that was built of many during his tenure is the one we're in this evening. And then finally, we have Professor Grogan, who will join us tonight as a guest speaker, uh, who is president of the Boston Foundation and traces his roots way back to when he was 12 years old and worked as an assistant to Kevin White, the mayor of Massachusetts. Without further ado, Judith. Thank you. So 
Boston, I would argue, is really well balanced. It is almost like that three-legged stool that we talk about, this great strength of stability, that uh, you can't rock it so well. Because of that, I think leadership in the city can come and does come from each of those sectors. And although at different times in our history, that has been an uneasy balance of power and competition, um, I would argue that it's actually relatively easy uh, and works very well now. And different sectors play different roles. I'd like to give you a couple of examples to make my point. Um, in January of this year, the Boston Foundation funded some, uh, a team of researchers from Harvard to look at charter schools and pilot schools, to compare the outcomes of charter schools and pilot schools, um, student performance. And what that study showed was that um, the charters outperformed pilot schools. Now, the school superintendent and the mayor um, disagreed with some of the methodology, some of the findings, but for the most part, took that and said, all right, if this is so, and if we have been basing some of our expectations and aspirations for high schools, particularly in Boston, on these pilot schools, and they're not performing as well as the charter schools, what can we learn about it for our own performance, but what also, since we disagree with some of the findings, what can we argue about the charter schools, since you know, we have some points about whom they take and, what the, and, and whether or not they have to keep them and some other things. So using that information, funded by the Boston Foundation, performed by, was it Harvard and MIT, but performed by two of our large um, academic institutions, we said we need to improve what we do in Boston. We cannot afford merely to go a charter route, lift the charter cap, since we have problems with you know, the notion of their selectivity and things like that. But we also believe in a public sector. And so what is it that we can learn from that? And from that, came this um, development of the notion of in-district charters, which is now part of legislation that we have in the State House to allow the city to do some of the things and to do it in a way that would let us do some the good things that we've learned from charters. The business community, it was recently as Tuesday, which was the only time the mayor has um, had an, uh, attended an event since he um, tore, I won't go into it, but it, with his great um, injury. Um, it's, but Tuesday morning, he was at the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, because he cannot stand right now, he, we had a panel, and the school superintendent laid out her opportunity, her um, acceleration agenda, her approach to improving public schools, that was informed a lot from this study, instigated by or, fun, or funded by the Boston Foundation, and engaged the business community through the Chamber of and Paul Guzzi announced something that the Chamber has rarely done, that this would become a priority in terms of pushing for legislation on the part of the Chamber and all the businesses because they saw its relevance, the kind of relevance that Barry talked about, the importance of having an excellent school system. That's a nice example. We'll see if we get the legislation, but it's a nice example of the kind of informing and use of information and material produced by others. Um, let me give you one that is so far as a failure. Um, the Center for Labor Market Studies here, Paul Harrington, did a wonderful report on, in a sense, the failure of community colleges to educate our children, our graduates, that the community colleges in Massachusetts, unlike those in many places across the country, do not necessarily see their mission as educating people for jobs or for careers or for continuing in higher education. Rather, they see their responsibility as one of access and acceptance of students. And that in the two community colleges within Boston, one had a graduation rate that is within three years of having an associate's degree. One of them had a rate of 4% of Boston high school graduates. And the other one had, I think, 7.5%. The mayor took that information we met with the community colleges. They seemed unmoved by the data. They did not think that that was their responsibility. The mayor at a chamber speech, the same chamber two years ago, truthfully blasted the community colleges, said that they needed to work with us and with business and we need to do something better. And truthfully, nothing's happened. So, but that, that's an attempt to use information generated here. On the other hand, other studies 
here at the Center for Labor Market Studies at Northeastern, the work that Andy Sum has done. Uh, um, supported by the Boston Foundation, working with the Boston PIC, which is already a public-private partnership. Um, identified college graduation rates across all colleges and universities for Boston high school graduates. And with the partnership and leadership of the Boston Foundation, the City of Boston, and UMass Boston, and Northeastern, and access agencies, um, the mayor convened all of these people, and we identified a goal of uh, increasing by 50% the college graduation rate of the class of 2011 over the data that we've already gathered, and um, doubling it by 2015, I'm making that up. But we have this wonderful partnership based on information provided by a leading academic institution that is informing our work and that has allowed us to pull together all of these agencies that support young people who are thinking about going to college, planning to go to college and in college, that has engaged the institutions of higher education, most of whom said, well, you know, it's whom you send us, it's not what we do. And, and by the way, why should we even bother to track them? Instead, we have this wonderful, collaborative um, endeavor to increase the graduation rate of Boston students. And it, it isn't just calling for it, it's uh, a massive program of doing more to get kids ready, more AP classes, more counseling in the schools, more credit recovery programs that the schools have to do, um, getting them in, having the access agencies be more involved once the, the, the earlier in, the, in a child's education, involved more with the families, doing um, taking responsibility for cohorts of students, and having the universities responsible for tracking them, providing information to them, and allowing the access agencies to participate. So there we have the kind of collaborative work that I would argue creates, um, is both a, um, a reflection of leadership coming from different places at different times and the initiative for public policy and programs coming from different places at different times. It does not always come from the public sector. It does not always come from the city, that is from the city government, from the mayor. Um, it, but it also cannot always come from these other two places for a couple of reasons. And let me give you another example. The responsibility of the city is for the education of its students. So the mayor has made education one of his priorities since actually before he was mayor. Um, and realizing that the time that a student spends in school is insufficient to have a fully developed human being and um, to make sure that kids do develop to their full potential. We, we, developed and built public-private partnerships on after-school programs, out-of-school programs, summer enrichment programs, job programs, a whole host of things to make it possible for kids to do better and, um, and to succeed. One of the things that was clear is that by the time a child entered kindergarten, it was often too late. And I don't mean that we ever give up on a child at 5 or 7 or 13 or 15 or even 20, but that the disadvantage of many children by the time they entered school was so great that you had to spend an awful lot of time closing that achievement gap, and it was wasteful. And so the mayor called together um, a small group, I think it was 12, leading um, academics and practitioners on early childhood education, both academics and practitioners from a whole host of institutions and organizations. to. Had to advise him and us about what we ought to do about making sure that children entered school ready to learn. From the work that they did, we convened 114 different people from across the city. And now it was academics, practitioners, parents, advocates, um, community-based institutions. And they spent a year hammering out what is a blueprint for success for children. A blueprint that ought to provide the, all the resources and all the systems and all the knowledge and all of the connections so that the children in this city will enter school ready to succeed. The support we got from 